Good afternoon. My name is Janet Justice, and I work in the Education and Events Department at FTD. I want to welcome you to our webinar titled, Prepare to be Profitable. Today, you will learn how to increase your profits through controlling your cost of goods sold. FTD Education Team member, Tina Coker, will be leading this informative webinar. Involved in the floral industry for more than 25 years, Tina combines creative design techniques with a common sense business approach to manage a successful company. As the owner of two flower shops in Florida and a past president of the American Institute of Floral Designers, Tina has established herself as an inspiring force in the floral industry. Once Tina is finished with her presentation, we will open the webinar up for questions. If you have a question, simply type it in the question box on the upper right side of your screen. We will take the questions in the order they are received. So without further ado, I would like to turn the call over to Tina to begin the webinar. Tina? Thank you, Janet. Um, I appreciate you and FTD giving us the opportunity to explore ways to uh, control our cost of goods and to prepare to be profitable. I want to invite, thank you all for attending this afternoon and let you know that this is, we're going to do, go through several um, Excel spreadsheets and don't panic if you um, can't look at them real closely. Uh, they will be downloadable um, via the FTD site. Um, in addition, we're going to look at some simple counting ways to control our cost of goods, and it's going to be more or less a place to start a conversation about controlling your cost of goods. So with that said, let's take a look, um, and this may seem basic, but we're going to start out basic and kind of move forward. Again, don't panic. It doesn't matter whether you're a small shop or a large shop. Um, for us, our small branch store employs the same uh, techniques as the larger store does here. So I look forward to questions at the end during the uh, seminar. If you'll just jot down any questions you have and perhaps the title of the page on the PowerPoint, uh, then we can refer back to it. So with that said, let's start with uh, preparing to be profitable. First question we have to ask is, what, what is cost of goods? Um, that really refers to, I mean, you could say cost of goods or cost of sales. No matter what acronym you use, it really is the items that you use to manufacture your arrangements. It is the products um, that is directly related to a sale. So if uh, you look at the next slide, it's at what cost of goods is. It is your sales minus your cost of goods equals profit, and that's why it's important. As a simple example, just to kind of explain what cost of goods is, if we buy 100 carnations um, at 35 cents, we're going to spend $35. If we sell those 100 carnations at $1.25, we're going to net $125 in sales. So as you can see in the example, that the sales minus the cost of goods equals our net profit. Now, a lot of you may be saying, well, you know, yeah, I, I, I get that, but why are they important? Well, they're extremely important when you think about the fact that the two major expenses in every flower business is, one, the cost of your employees, and two, the cost of goods. So let's consider for a moment, and I know that every commentator at every design program that you've ever been to tells you you need to control your cost of goods, and they'll give you some example about one flower. Well, in this case, I've done something very similar, where if I buy one or put one extra 50-cent flower in an arrangement, and I do 20 arrangements that day, I'm going to spend $10 I shouldn't have had to spend. If I donate an arrangement a week, uh, we're looking at $15.60 in, in wholesale cost, if I don't check off my invoices and a vendor shorts me flowers, that could cost me as much as $8.90. If for some reason I don't rotate my pro product properly, I may have to replace an order. And in this case, that's $17.80 in wholesale cost. And number five, which is one of the most difficult things, is to account for all those small little things that go into an arrangement that we don't expense out. And that would be the card, the pick, the floral foam, uh, the cardette, any of those items. And if we don't account for those on a daily basis, that could range us, run us up to about $15 a day. So if you look in the example, today if we didn't do these five items, we would have spent $67.30. In a week, that could equate to $403.80. And in a total year, that could equate to almost $21,000. Now that's a hefty sum. But if you think about it, if you have a 6% bottom line, that $21,000, you would have to do an additional sales of $350,000 to gain back that $20,000 that you ever stuffed in arrangement. That's why cost of goods are so important. In my mind, when it comes to cost of 
goods or when it comes to balancing my budget, if I can save a dollar, I've earned that dollar. But if I um, if I save a dollar, I net that dollar. But if I um, don't control my cost of goods, that 6%, that net 6 cents, as in the previous example, would mean that I'd have to make much more. So in essence, it's better to control your cost of goods and save that dollar. Some of the factors that affect your cost of goods are promotional donations and giveaways. We're going to talk a little bit about ways to control that. When you do a sales discount, a lot of times when, um, for a lot of shops, they'll either look at their statement uh, yearly and look at their cost of goods, which it's difficult to be able to control that cost of goods through the year if you only look at your P&L statement once a year. Some of them do it quarterly, and others will do it monthly. We're going to talk a lot about different general ledger accounts that control things that affect that cost of goods factor. So if you look at your cost of goods on a monthly basis and you see that you didn't hit your target and you're a little bit distressed, one of the things may be your sales discount. So we're going to talk about doing the accounting, basic accounting to um, account for that sales discount. Of course, theft of merchandise, uh, poor pricing policies, an uncontrolled design room. We'll talk about several different techniques in, in that respect. And then distribution of sales in a category. Now, that's not going to make a whole lot of sense until we get to the spreadsheet, so we're just going to leave it at that and move on to the next slide. When I talked about uh, promotional donations and giveaways, one of the ways that we solve this is we have a donation request form. Uh, again, this is downloadable from the site if you'd like to, to use this copy. This is actually something I got from a florist years and years ago. What I find works is that before we started tracking our donation request form, we found that we would spend a lot of money yearly, close to $70,000 in donations. Well, if we're going to spend $70,000 in donations, you know, I'd like to filter some of that $70,000 to advertising budget, where I can actually get physical advertising items either via email or direct mail into my client's hands. So what I found is if I track the donations and ask them to fill out the form, in some ways a lot of um, the smaller you know, oh, I can't think of who it was, the candle candle something or other. They collect candles and they wanted a donation from the store. And so I have them fill out this request form. Nine times out of ten, they probably will not. The major companies that um, you really get the best exposure will definitely fill out the request for donation form. It allows you to um, have a policy in place that lets them know that you have a limited budget to, to uh, do donations. And it also um, gives you information on who they are, who else is donating, um, and what your signage will be, all those given information so you can decide whether it's a good value for the, the funds that you're going to, to spend. Whether it is donations, promotions, or replacements, you're really going to want to set up a general ledger account and an in-house billing account to, to track this information for a, a multitude of reasons. Um, the first thing I would recommend is you create a house count. And at Designs of the Times, we have you know Designs of the Times donations, donate, uh, Designs of the Times promotion, Designs of the Times replacement. It's an account where every invoice gets billed to. So if we create an order, a ticket to donate a gift certificate or an arrangement, it goes into the donations and so on with promotions and for replacements. I think it's a great way. Um, to look at what you're spending in each one of those categories. For me, replacements is one of the ones that I look at quite regularly. If I get a high replacement rate on a monthly bill on that house account, then I'm going, wait a minute, what are we doing wrong and why are we having to do these replacements? So every time you decide to donate, promote, or do a replacement, you're going to bill the invoice to that account. Monthly, you're going to pay that account. You're going to do it as a, a um, like you're actually client paying a check to that account. Then you need to go in and post the general ledger entry because one, you want to remove the sales out of that sales account because when you created that ticket, that invoice, you just billed to, you increased your sales and it is in all actuality not a sale. So you want to debit that sale account and remove that sale out of there. And when it comes to the cash account, you want to credit it to remove that check that you posted, that theoretical check. Now is where you're going to expense this so you can track it. And you're going to do it, if your cost of goods target is 33%, you're going to do it at that 33%. And so on, if it's the donation uh, expense account, you're going to debit it. 
if it is promotion, um, you would debit it. If it's replacements, you would debit that general ledger account by the cost of your cost of goods. So if your cost of goods is 20% or 25, you would use that. Uh, in this case, I'm just using a random 33%. The next thing you would do is you would credit the cost of goods account. And why? Because you want, when you do these sales, you don't want it to uh, be expense to cost of goods. You want it to be expense to the general ledger account, whether it's donations, promotions, or replacements. When I talked about sales discounts, uh, again, you want to put the full value of any item in there. You want to credit back. You want to have an account in your general ledger account that is sales discounts, which is a um, negative. Uh, revenue account. And the reason for that is, is let me give you an example in our case. Once a year we do a garage sale. And we do two garage sales and the reason for it is to move out merchandise that has not sold and we you know we want our showroom to look nice and full and we want it to look like the merchandise rotates relatively quickly. So once a year we do a garage sale uh, that benefits the Cancer Society. And when we do that we ring the sale up at full value and then we put the discount in there. So when I'm looking at my sales volume, my sales volume is going to be lower. And that sales inventory sales is what your cost of goods is calculated again against. If I didn't have that negative revenue account in there, what would end up happening would be I would look at my cost of goods figure and I would go, oh my gosh, my cost of goods went up to 50, 60 percent. What, you know, what were the designers doing? When in all essence what it is is that we sold that merchandise at a decreased value. So again, to reiterate, bring it up at full value, create a negative revenue account, which would be where that sales discount would fall. It's a great way to move slow moving merchandise. You want to take that money in, in the case of if you have some kind of special or sale and take that money to move that merchandise out and then be able to buy new merchandise that will sell. The next is theft of merchandise, and, and unfortunately, I recently read, probably about a year ago, an article, um, and you know, I, I love my staff, I think I have a great staff, but I read an article recently where majority of merchandise theft comes from employees. So uh, whether it's your employees or people shoplifting, I would recommend that you, one, install security cameras. Um, do not leave any of your customers or clients on the sales floor by themselves. Uh, in my case, my sales floor is open to my design area, but I know the other location is not. Uh, so it's important that one, you be out there to greet you greet your customers and let them know, you know, welcome to, you know, in essence, I think that when they visit your store, um, it's kind of like visiting your home. You want to greet them and you know make sure they feel welcome. So don't leave them out on the sales floor. It serves two pers two purposes. One, it makes them feel very welcoming, and two, it makes sure that you can um, not have little sticky fingers. Uh, I believe that all shops should have a policy manual and it should state the discount and that employees should never ring up their own sales. Um, and as an owner, I follow that policy. Whenever I purchase something, I make someone else, if I'm sending flowers out of town to friends for a funeral, whatever, uh, for birthday, I make sure that someone else rings up my sale and I put it on my house account and I write a check to that. Um, the other thing that you might want to do if you have an inventory control system at all is to enter the inventory. A good example for us is, um, and that way you can check that inventory to see when you're running low on items, but enter a quantity and that way when you do your physical inventory, and I recommend doing physical inventory twice, and the reason for that is, is we're going to talk about a little bit later on in the difference between cash and accrual and relieving inventory based on arrangements, uh, total sales volume. So if you do physical inventory twice a year, you can tell if things are disappearing. Let's say in your physical inventory you bought 70 boxes of chocolates and you had sales of 60, but there are only two left. You know that one, either someone's not ringing something up and you can correct it so that that sale goes to the appropriate um, sales revenue account, or two, that things are starting to miss and maybe somebody's having lunch, chocolate for lunch. Uh, the other thing is to make sure you check off all shipments. You know, I've dealt with some of the same companies for close to 30, 31, 32 years, and you know, they're they're great. They're computerized. They do wonderful. But every once in a while, just keep in mind that computers are only as good as the operators, and every once in a while they can make a mistake. So make sure you check off your sh shipments as they received. Now, accounting is about the balance is checks. Uh, checks and balances. That's what it is. That's why you have a debit and a credit in accounting. And one of the things you need to do is just if you 
don't do all the counting yourself or if you have a bookkeeper, set up a system of checks and balances. So if one person posts the invoice from all your wholesale companies, then someone else should pay that bill. That way you have you know um, in, in my case, I have someone who posts the invoices and then I check off the bill and pay the bill. A system of checks and balances. The next would be poor pricing policy. We're going to talk a little bit and we're going to go to a, an Excel in a minute about inconsistent pricing and sale categories. Um, in the flower business, we're kind of at a disadvantage. When we manufacture a product, it not only has to be, the cost of goods have to be there so that you make a profit, but you also have to do, deal with things called visual value. And in some cases, when we don't have a, a spelled out pricing policy and designers are going towards a visual value, you can have a little bit of problem there. Uh, we're going to talk about calculations of markups and how to hit that target. Um, and to me, I think that pricing policy should avail be available to the staff. They need to know what the markups are. For us, on every desktop of every uh, computer in the in the both stores has a how-to book, and in the how-to book, it says uh, if you get giftware in, how to calculate the markup on it, what the current markup is. Um, and depending upon how you do your markup or how whether you flip your tickets over and do it on the back, you want to be consistent, meaning you want to either use wholesale value or retail value, never mix the two. So if you don't want your staff to know what the markup on your flowers are, then generally do wholesale value. Um, if you on, if not, they could just do retail, either one, but make it consistent that you use either wholesale pricing or retail pricing for your designers and your staff. The other area where um, it comes into poor pricing policy is a lot of times we don't account for shrinkage. Generally, industry average is about 10%, um, and uh, freight varies <laughs> in these days of gas prices. Um, it used to be freight was you know 5, 7, now it's 10, sometimes in some companies at 27%. So in order to do that, uh, every individual item when you get a shipment in, you should multiply below by the percentage of the freight. And generally to get that, you would take the cost of the freight and divide it by the cost of the items on the invoice. And that will give you your percentage. Then take that item cost and multiply it by that percentage. You should also multiply it by 10% because that's about what you shrinkage. And in that case, let's say you have lilies sitting on the floor and they're in a bad spot and everybody keeps brushing by them or carnation heads pop off, industry standard is 10%. So before you price any item, make sure you include the freight percentage and the 10% shrinkage. And the other poor pricing policy thing that I'd like to share with you is to make sure that you code all your giftware. Um, this was, a, you know, I've known this for probably 15, 20 years that, you know, we've coded, used barcoding as well as, you know, a, a gimmick code, which you see on the screen, um, to price everything. And it wasn't until we, this last year, where we did the uh, garage, started, the year before last, we started the garage sale for um, the store that I found out, oh my gosh, I have some really slow merchant, moving mer merchandise. An example of that would be, if you look at the last line of this, this slide, where it says G12 I'd just like to share with you that this G is, um, let me find a pointer. This G right here stands for giftware. That is my sales category. The um, one, 12, 1, 2 means it was bought in 2012, 0, 1 means that it's in January, and then the 1250 is the wholesale cost of that item. Now why that's important is that um, when we decide to discount that item or someone, and in today's society I've, I've found that um, being cheap is the new chic thing to be, we have oftentimes have clients that come in and say, well, you know, what can I buy this for? What's the lowest price you'll give me? Because in today's couponing and discounts at every major retailer, we get that question more often than we ever had in the last 30 years. So I want to be able to know what the cost of that item is, including freight, and um, and be able to say, well, you know, in my mind I'm going, okay, well, I have 12.50 in this, and it's this was bought in, instead of 2012, it was bought in 2010, and it still hasn't moved. Well, then maybe I can sell it for less than the two-time markup. 
So make sure that all your gift floor is coded for two reasons. One, so that you know the cost on it when you're doing inventory. And two, so that you know when to rotate that product out. So let's move from this to look a little bit about pricing. And these are some of the Excels that I was talking about. Um, and they are open-ended, so you can actually um, enter your own amounts in there. And this is something that I learned probably in 1986 at an FTD Master Floors Manager program. And I thought it was a real eye-opener eye as far as calculating what my cost of good target was. So in this case, I'm going to choose a desired profit of $60,000. And I know that my operating cost is somewhere around 125000 So that means my gross profit on operations is 185000 Now, I need to subtract out other income. Now, let me just clarify what I mean about other income. Other income is your delivery fees, uh, if you charge a relay fee on outbound wire orders, if you rent equipment. It is anything that is not a inventory product. If, and what, other, what else goes in this category is the 20% income that you earn on um, wire out business. So I'm going to less out my other income of, let's say, 32000 And that means my gross profit on inventory sales is 153000 Now I'm going to say that my inventory, forecasted inventory sales is going to be 225000 And that means for this year, my cost of goods that I have to sell is $72,000, which equates to my target, which is 32%. So that's going to be my cost of goods target for the year. Well, that's great, but let's look at our break-even scenario. Now, on our pricing policy, we said our cost of goods was going to be 32%. So let's go ahead and put in 32% in here and enter our operating expenses, which were 125000 That means I need to have inventory sales of 183000 at least to make a profitable bottom line. And again, don't worry, um, all of these Excel sheets will be available online if you'd like to kind of play around with your physical numbers. If you're a new store and you're just starting out, you may not have a num uh, those numbers yet, but we'll uh, speak to that in a little bit. But if you're an established shop, then you can put the numbers in um, and take a look at where you're at. And we have a very I'm going to start looking at um, the design and where that may ca cause an issue. Now, I'm a big proponent. You know, I love creative design, and I have to tell you that we, we do a lot of our own designs and shoot them and put them in our system so that we um, have them on hand. But all of them are recipe I think that for me as a designer, when I'm sitting on the design table and I have an order comes in and we're not, you know, doing assembly line design, we're doing, you know, one arrangement at a time because someone chooses our... Um, shining day bouquet and so when the staff rings it up as a shining day bouquet and the invoice prints out I have um, a visual recipe on there so I know when I walk in the cooler and I don't know if it's just because I'm getting to that age where I forget things um, it's nice to take that little piece of paper in the cooler with me and be able to pick um, the products off of there 
knowing what color I'm going to use um, and how many stem count and knowing that that profit is already built into that recipe. For me, um, one of the other things that helps me control my design room is having standing orders. The uh, majority of our product, and we'll talk a little bit later uh, in the program about that, but a lot of the product we get is on standing orders. The same things come every single week um, from Miami to us. And then we buy the things that interest us, and we have an open to buy policy, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And that open to buy is what we buy all the fun stuff with. But standing orders do not have to be boring. I mean, for us, we have uh, hydrangeas, gerberas, lilies, alstroemerias, and of course, carns, palms, and roses on standing order. Rotation policy, there are so many different ways to rotate your product. Um, years ago, I talked to a florist who actually used dowel rods in their buckets. And based on um, the week, or the day of the week is when the flowers came in, was the color of the dowel rod that sat in the bucket. I think um, another florist did the same thing with uh, little flags and PVC that they stuck in the bucket so they know what day that came in so they know when it needed to be rotated. For me, I find it easier that um, when, when something gets, needs to be rotated, we have someone who just takes care of the coolers, assign that cooler, whether it's the designer of the day, you know, after she's finished her daily orders, her job is to go into the cooler because our coolers are walk-in where everybody comes in and sees everything. Uh, her job is to go in there, consolidate buckets, move anything that's ones and twos to the work bucket. Because think about it, when it comes to designing, um, and you're a designer, and I, I have flower envy as much as the next person, and I walk into that cooler, what ends up happening is I see, you know, a bucket's got one and two or something, and then I see this nice full bucket of product. Well, I'm going to go to the full bucket, because that's just human nature. Um, you need to have someone in your shop, whether it's you, to be the flower Nazi, and have that use it up mentality. Uh, here, our little mantra has been since 1984, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. And for that reason, we actually have um, use it up shelf where all of our other containers are prepped and sitting, and then there's a shelf of product that's either ones or twos or something, or um, might be a container, let's say a holiday container that for Christmas that didn't get used, or Valentine's Day, we put it up on that using it up container and we find a way to use it. Mentally focusing on rotating that product is the biggest thing to overcome in the design room. A lot of shops price arrangements on the back of every order. I think this is a great policy. Um, I will show it to you. I prefer to use the recipes because it's quicker. And um, even though I love math, I can tell you that 97.9% .9 of my staff hates math. And uh, so pricing on the back of every order is somewhat difficult. One of the best things that I have seen, um, and it's an old thing from the, um, where you had a chart on the design room wall and if you had a $25 arrangement it would tell you that you had that your container cost could be two dollars and that your flower cost could be let's say seven dollars and so for the designer when they're looking for a container they didn't go over and choose a fourteen dollar container for a twenty five dollar order um, I think it's a great way to make it easier for designers and anytime you can make it easier then you can control your design room um, years ago, I used to come up with you know these fabulous ways to do things, but they were so hard and difficult to implement that nobody would do them. So I I subscribe to the Kiss Simple uh, philosophy, which is keep it simple and silly. Uh, you can use technology to um, make it easier, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And the last thing I'd like to leave with you on the uncontrolled design room is to make sure you account for all your supplies. So if your little mantra is to put little buzzy bees and stuff or to put um, butterflies, that's fabulous because it's a great way to brand your company. But on the other hand, you're going to want to make sure that that is built into the, the uh, supply cost on every order that goes out. So the steps to profit is first to calculate your target percentage um, on your cost of goods, which we've just done. Uh, refine define the design process. Figure out the best way for your staff to work within um, your pricing policies, whether that's a chart, whether it's flipping the order over and writing it on the back, or whether it's using recipes, or whether it's using technology. Uh, budget your buying and then price effectively. We're going to talk about both of those. And to do that, we're going to switch to your pricing policy.
this is a simple spreadsheet. Most people will use a benchmark of a 2. Point, you know, 2.25 on hard goods and 3.5 on um, on fresh flowers. Um, they'll use silks like 2.5 or 2.75, and that'll be benchmark pricing. A lot of shops use the same markup on everything. I prefer to do varying markups. It's an old um, accounting thing um, from years and years ago. Um, and what that allows me to do is it allows me to compete in a marketplace. To give you an example, years ago um, when I first opened the store, I was in a little strip mall and I was next to a Publix grocery store who carried flowers. And um, my job was to bring people into the showroom. And for us, most shops, uh, industry averages is the walk-in is about 35% and the phone is about 65%. Even today, I'm located on a, the main store is located on a dead-end street. Um, it's off the main drag, and our walk-in is closer to 55 to 60%, and our phone-in is the balance of that. So we have found a way by competing against some of the, uh, like if it's a grocery store or another vendor, um, gift vendor, whether it's you know perfume, whatever, we have found a way to make gifts affordable by playing with our markups. And it gives me a, an advantage against other outlets. So in this case, if you could just follow along with me for a second, um, you can notice that down here, my markup is my cost of goods uh, percentage is at 27.92. Now how this works is, is if I take the percentage of sales and I multiply it by the markup, it gives me the cost of goods percentage. So what I'm doing is taking a category sale, in this case it's loose, and I'm going to play with that markup. And let's say I change this to 1.75. Now look down here, my cost of goods has gone from 27 to 28. 0.6%. If my cost of goods target is that 30 or 32%, I'm still under it. So what does that mean? It means that I can start cash and carrying loose flowers at a less markup, which allows me to compete with any other vendor in town. Matter of fact, in most cases, I end up being less expensive. But let's say my cost of goods target was more like 20, 26, 27. So that means I'm going to have to choose another category and make a higher markup. And let's say we decide to do that in silks because I don't do a large percentage of that. I'm going to make it 3.30. That didn't help. So let's do, I'm still not getting towards my target. I want to get, let's say we'll do 5.75. It's starting to lower a little bit. Roses, we'll say plants 4.25 because I buy them direct. And see how it affects that number. This number keeps changing to get me to my target. This is an interesting way to do your, your cost of goods so that um, you have the ability to compete against other vendors. And that's where I think it's important. And that's one of the ways I think we built our cash and carry business or our walk-in business. I have people come in all the time. You know, For years, we sold carnations at $3.95 a dozen. We had a lower markup on them. But we would sell close to seven, eight cases a week on them. So, And it brings those people in. Now, there's the other side of the argument who would say, well, now they won't buy flowers you know, full arrangements. Well, uh, for our tracking, to a certain extent, most of those people would have bought the flowers somewhere else. And in, in majority of the cases, when it comes to a funeral or a birthday or some other kind of events, they have a tendency to purchase from us. So for us, and um, that's my market, it has worked out relatively well. The next thing to explore is whether cash or cruel, because this will make the, the biggest frustrating thing for you ever, depending upon which way you decide to do your accounting system. Cash means everything is expensed when you buy it. So if you buy 25 cases of glassware, then that gets expensed right now in that cost of goods. Um, it's easy to input into your accounting system because whenever you write a check, it automatically goes into cost of goods, whether you're buying you know, uh, hard goods, which would be anything that lasts over a week. Um, or whether you're buying fresh flowers, it automatically gets expense when you buy it. For me, I'm not a big fan of cash accounting because it doesn't give you an accurate picture. Uh, an example of that would be, let's say, in October, you buy all of this Christmas merchandise and you spend thousands of dollars, but those sales aren't going to come till December. So in October, at the end of the month, when you look at your P&L and you look at your cost of goods, and your cost of goods are 70% of your sales, you're going, oh my 
gosh, what did I do wrong? Um, and then you can't really tell um, that you've you know, you actually made a profit during October. Whereas in December, you'll look at it and you'll go, oh my gosh, I had a great profit because my cost of goods was only 10%. So cash is, a, is an easy way to do it. And if you moderate your buying, if you buy small amounts at a time, then I would recommend cash. Um, but accrual to me is my favorite. And the reason why is because you're going to expense the product in the month that it happens. The only problem is, is there's a little bit more accounting that's uh, required with that. And the way that works is, is when you buy those 25 cases of glassware, they're going to go into inventory account called hard goods. And then as you make that sale, um, you have to leave that inventory and put it into your cost of goods that month. And that's usually going to be a percentage of whatever your sales are in whatever category. Now for me, let's, uh, my cost of goods or hard goods uh, percentage is 7%. But if you want to figure out what your percentage is, it's very easy. Take your average sale, whether that's 35 or $45 and add up any of your hard goods. That would be your vase, your cardette. Um, if it, it was, uh, generally, if you do a lot of things in foam, then your floral foam cost, the tape that you might use, um, the card that you, know, you print to put on with the arrangement. And you can add up all of the cost on that. You're going to take that and you're going to divide it by your, that, your average sale, whether it was 35 or 45, and that's going to give you your percentage of hard goods that you need to relieve. And this may vary from year to year, and it may vary. So generally, you're going to want to do a physical inventory twice a year to adjust that uh, inventory uh, GL account to make sure that um, you know, you're relieving the right amount of percentage. In my case, it's 7%. For some shops, it's 10%. To me, it gives you, if you do an accrual accounting, it gives you a more accurate picture of what your cost of goods are because you're expensing things in the month that they actually happen. And to show you an example, because I think it's always good to take a look at um, basic P&L statements. Uh, to take a look at um, what the percentages are. These are percentages that um, uh, that are industry, somewhat industry standards. So um, as you can see, 33% is an, an industry standard. But to me, when you do your P&L, uh, it's a great idea to kind of uh, match this when you're doing your budgeting and take a look at where um, match the numbers that you have. You can see here uh, the two biggest things, obviously, are the 33% cost of goods and your payroll, which is 20%. I just want to qualify that. Uh, generally, industry standard is if the owner is not receiving a paycheck, then this payroll expense should be no higher than about 20% because 10% of your bottom line would go to the, to the owner. Uh, in my case, I actually receive a check every, I'm an employee of the business and I receive a check, so my payroll is closer to 20, 25 to 27%. But this is a general um, great barometer and it's one of the things that I have a lot of florists ask me over the years is, you know, what should I be spending? Well, this spreadsheet, you can just essentially put in whatever your, uh, your sales for the year, previous year were, and it'll tell you what you should be spending in any given category. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to share that with you today, because I do get that question quite a bit. Varying markups, which is one of the things that we just explored. Again, I can't reiterate this enough. Um, the varying markups was the spreadsheet where we talked about um, changing your markup percentages on any given sales category. Um, it's a creative way to be able to compete. And the other one is benchmark. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that benchmark in the industry seems to be 2.5 on hard goods and 3.5 on fresh flowers. And that cost of good target um, should generally be between that 25 and 33 percent. Now that 25 and 33 percent does include that 7 um, 7 percent of your hard goods. So if you're doing your cost of goods statement and you end up at 17 percent, you go, wow, man, I didn't spend a lot. Just remember that you have to relieve that inventory and move it from um, inventory into your cost of goods to make that 24, 25 percent. Another great way to control your cost of goods is to put yourself on a budget. Um, one of my best friends just gave me this, I don't know if this is an insult or not, but she just gave me this new phone app. It's called Fitness Pal. 
and it allows me to track every calorie I eat every day, and it's very easy to do, so it focuses me on how much I have to spend on calories. So um, when I'm talking about how much fresh product to, to buy, is what I'm trying to do is to get you to focus on how much you should buy. And the first thing you're going to want to look at is uh, previous year's month sales in category. So uh, for January of this year, I looked at January of last year. And I'm going to divide it by my markup. So if my markup's, you know, 33%, um, I'm going to divide it by 33% and, um, and, and look at how much I have to buy that month. I'm going to subtract out what I must have in flowers, meaning uh, for me that would be standing order. And for you, I'm sure there is a combination. You know, some shops don't carry carnations or, or alstroemeria or chrysanthemums. But whatever your must-haves are, whatever your client base dictates that you need to keep in stock uh, on a regular basis just to fill quantity of orders, you're going to want to subtract out what you must have. And that gives you what's open to buy. This is just an example of that. Let's say my sales total for that month of January is 10,000 and my markup was 33%. That means I have 3,300 to buy flowers with. I'm going to subtract out what my must have is. What are the things that I, if I have to have X amount of roses that I sell based on my sales category, um, and, or hydrangeas or lilies and my must have is $2,000. That means I have $1,100 to buy with this month. And I could go a step further and divide that by uh, four and say, okay, this is what I have to, or divided by 26, this is what I can buy each day. Now, you're going to want to, what this says is the only thing this does is to try to focus you in what you need to buy. And for me, this was one of the biggest things to help me when I first started in the industry because you love flowers. And to give you a prime example is I absolutely, every silk wholesaler that came to my store, I bought something from. You know, years ago, they used to have trucks that would come around, and they'd have you know flowers, and I'd go buy silk flowers. I loved permanent botanicals. They were the best thing in the world, and I would buy them all the time. And what ended up happening was when I looked at the you know at the end of the month or even at the end of the year, and my sales total was you know five thousand dollars in the silk category, and yet I spent eight thousand dollars in silks. And I'm going, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. So really, this is just in essence uh, the opportunity to kind of focus on what you can buy. And let's move real quickly to the other application and look at sales per month, which is another thing when I talked about if you are new to the business and um, don't know what your average sales per month would be. Um, this is another spreadsheet. And uh, let's say your annual sales are $350,000. It means that in January, your average sales at 6.2% is going to be $21,000. And this is, again, something um, from an old seminar that I learned years ago. And um, I still check these numbers against when I'm projecting sales, um, what I'd like to have or what I think is going to be that month. Um, when I have added a shop, uh, it allows me to let me know what I can expect out of that, out of that location if you don't have any numbers to track. And again, it's kind of fun for me. It is because you know I'm such an accounting geek. But I always find it easy if I'm if I decide that two years from now my goal is I want to be at two million dollars. Then I look at if I put that in there, which I don't know how many zeros is that. <laughs> if I decide I wanted to do two million dollars, it would mean that this is what I'd need for sales in the month of January. And Lord, if I hit that, I'd be just like to have, be retiring the next year. So we've looked at um, what our sales per month should be and what our buying should be. And one of the other components is dumpage. And why this is important is because if you start to keep track of what you dump, you will start to see specific trends. Uh, you'll notice on here that I have um, the date that it was received and the date that it was tossed, and who the vendor was, what the product was, and what the reason was. And of course, the quantity, unit, and cost, and total balance. Well, the reason why this is extremely important is let's say there's a vendor. I, I can think of one specifically that comes on a truck every, every day here to the store. And it wasn't until we looked at the dumpage sheet that we found out that we would buy product from them and the life in our cooler, much less consider the life at our client's home, was only like two or three days. It was amazing. And that's when we decided, you know what, we can't buy from this vendor anymore. It also talked 
it also does product. Let's say um, there's a product that's not necessarily holding for you. Then you can know that when you decide to have that product, I'm going to have to rotate it out quickly. And that's something you can share with your, your staff. The other thing that it will illustrate quite regularly let's, is that you're dumping too much product. And it could be one of those things where you're buying product and you're just not um, selling it in a timely manner. So then you back up to your buying. The previous slide when we talked about your, you know, what you can buy, and you say, wait a minute, I'm buying too much product. I have to lower this. So a dumping sheet is extremely important for all of those reasons. You need to track how much you're buying and how much you're dumping. Now, for me, I like to track it throughout the year. So when I looked at my cost to sales accounts, I'll have a cost to sales accounts for fresh flowers, for permanent botanicals, for plants, for dish garden blooming, giftware, balloons. And underneath that, I also have dumpage. So every month, I take the total of the month of this dumpage, and I take it out of the cost of good account it was in, and I moved it into dumpage. So that way, I know what I'm dumping every single month, and I can keep track of it by the end of the year. Again, it's really just taking a look at this information so that you can, um, with common sense, figure out the best way to solve your cost of goods issues. This is an extremely old form. This is something that you would, uh, what we call a cost up form. And um, if you were making arrangements for your cooler, this is what you would do. You would um, obviously, in this case, we're going to take all of our fresh flower items. We're going to multiply it by the quantities with the retail price. If you're using wholesale, that's perfectly OK as well, just either re retail or wholesale. And that's going to give you a total amount of each individual item. My total for the fresh, which is all of these items added together, is $20.55. I'm going to account for all those supplies, the card at, the card, uh, the invoice that the prints on. I'm going to add in the container. And then I'm going to get a subtotal of $25.05. I'm going to use a labor fee of 20% or $5, meaning the price when I put this arrangement in the cooler should be $30. And that's costing up. On the reverse of that, there's the cost down formula. And essentially what that is, is um, let's say an order comes in and the customer says, I want to spend $35. And you go, OK, I've got $35. I'm going to immediately take out my labor. In this case, the labor is going to be $7, which is 20%. I'm going to take out my $3 container. I'm going to take out my $1.50 in supplies. And that's going to subtotal $11.50. I'm going to take that $11.50 and subtract it for the $35. And that's going to tell me that I have $23.50 to use for fresh cut flowers. So I do the same process that I did on the previous one. I'm going to take how many flowers I put in, multiply it by the retail price, and it gives me an amount. I total it down. And right now I'm at $23.30, which means I'm under this budget of $23.50. An excellent way to control your cost of goods is doing the cost up or the cost down. And again, I want to reiterate, you can also do a chart. Uh, you can use recipes. But any way that you can control your cost of goods is to focus on what you're spending. And this is a great way to do that, is to have this either printed on the form or to have your designers know this formula so that they can price arrangements that, so they're profitable. And while we're talking about pricing, I just want to um, go across some pricing barriers and philosophy. Uh, we all know that there are certain barriers that customers will spend, um, and you see those listed, 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, um, 25, 30, 15. Um, the thing about it is, is if you've got an arrangement and it prices out at uh, $27, you're probably better off to go to $29.99 and get that $2.99 extra because you know that the price barrier is $30. And you can get that $2.99 extra by making it $29.99. And that brings me to the second point. Uh, point. Psychologically, uh, $0.95 cents is viewed as a regular price, where $99 is viewed as a sale price. So you may, might, may want to make that $29.95 instead of $29.99. So the way you can, as I mentioned before, the way you can garnish a couple more extra dollars is to use that psychological pricing. Five dollars may seem like a lot to a client, um, whereas four ninety nine would not, and they still consider that four ninety nine four dollars. Uh, the other thing that we found out about pricing is that repetitive numbers work really well. So if you did uh, $66.66, that's probably a good thing, but $77.77 is better because sevens work well. 
an interesting thing because I have two schools of thought when it comes to pricing. And one of them is, yes, we could use those pricing barriers, those just under barriers, like the $39.95 or the $49.95. And that way I get, you know, a $40 sale for a nickel less instead of, you know, because they still think it's $30. The other thing is when you do that, it has a tendency, I mean, it works really, really well until you get to a higher price point, like $75, $100, $115, 200 That's where you're going to want to use exclusive, what they call exclusive pricing, which is 40 50 60 70 80 90 for me, we used to always do the 39.95, 49.95, 59.95, and have made the change to the 40, 50, 60 because we consider ourselves a more exclusive outlet, and uh, that is part of our our marketing, our mantra of the shop, our overall branding is that we want to be more exclusive. So we'll use exclusive pricing opposed to the just under barrier pricing. There are several schools of thought when it comes to pricing. We've talked about, you know, pricing cost up, cost down, uh, the psychological. But the other thing is a great book that I read years ago was uh, by Ken Royer, and he prices everything, all the flowers, the same. And then he adds the appropriate markup based on labor. And I think that's a great idea, because think about it. When it comes to funeral designs, obviously it takes more time to do an easel spray than it does a clear glass vase. And so you could adjust these are just examples. If it was an everyday design, you may use a 20% labor markup. A funeral might be 30, and of course wedding 40 or 50, uh, depending upon what you, what you decide is the best pricing policy to, to reach your financial goals. But I did want to share that with you because I think it's a great way to make customers understand that it's not that flowers are expensive, it is the labor of putting them together that's expensive. We're going to talk about controlling things um, with, um, with recipes. I prefer to use um, uh, our Mercury system to do that. Uh, it, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, and I'm going to switch to Mercury, and I'm going to go into my designer, and hopefully there's something in the queue, or they probably finished for the day. But we're going to take a look at um, the ability to see the recipes. And um, Okay, they're really good. They've got today and tomorrow's orders on. Oh, no, they didn't. Okay. And you notice this Port St. John, this Rota Lewis, um, it has an item number. The great thing about this is, is I can, um, these items down here, this recipe prints on the ticket. Uh, the designer has a visual picture of it. When I walk into the cooler, as I mentioned before, I know that I'm going to go in there and get three spray roses, and I'm not going to be looking at a uh, design workbook where, you know, I look at it and go, okay, I've got to remember, i got spray roses, uh, mini carns, daisy palms. I walk in the cooler and I go, oh, gosh, what color were the daisies? And I have to come back out. This way they've got a printed copy in their hand. Uh, you don't necessarily, you can put your own items into it. Um, and most of your POS systems that are on the market now allow you to do this. I really recommend if you're trying to control your cost of goods, get a POS system. Uh, like I said, there's so many of them out on the market now, and the ch and majority of them, if not all, you can enter in your own designs and have something similar to a recipe. To me, that is the easiest way to control um, your cost of goods, is to um, go ahead and And what I think is a great idea is to go ahead and do um, collections, like we will do collections, uh, like spring collections, winter collections, um, and all of those collections will have um, um, uh, cute little names. They'll have their recipes already fixed. Um, they'll be in, you know, standard, deluxe, and premium. And my designers don't have to to really kind of think about calculating it out. They can certainly relax and enjoy design. And we all decide which designs we're going to put in our collections, and um, and it works out really really good that way. Um, like again, just reiterate. You want to print recipes or be able to do that cost up, cost down. You can add your own design, and um, the best thing about it is, is you're letting technology assist you in controlling your cost of goods. Anything that you can automate is certainly going to make it a quick, faster, quicker process. Anything that's easy, you're going to be able to keep your designers on board. It may be a little bit of a stumbling block firsthand, but generally, after a little bit, um, you'll be able to get them to. 
to get on board with using technology, to get on board with controlling your cost of goods. And I've talked about a lot of different things, and this is somewhat of a simple little program on controlling your cost of goods, and, and every florist I meet has a hundred different ideas. Really, uh, what my hope for you all today that are attending the seminar is, is that you'll think about your cost of goods, you'll look at them every single month, and um, figure out ways that work best from you. Uh, for you, um, whether it's something that I've mentioned today or whether it's something you've heard from another florist, because the two most expensive things are payroll and cost of goods. If you can control those two things, you can make a profit. And when you pay attention to something or if you aim at something, um, you'll be able to, to make it better. And my favorite saying is the last one you'll see on here, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So if you really don't pay a good attention to the cost of goods, it's really going to eat up your profit. And with that, I'd like to say that if you have any questions um, or want copies of the handouts, uh, the email address is up there. And um, now that I'm finished rattling on about basic accounting, um, I will turn it back over to Janet for questions. Janet? Thank you, Tina, so much for sharing lots of great information with us today. Um, we are now open for questions. Um, if you have a question, simply type it in the question box on the upper right side of your screen, and we will take the questions in the order they are received. And um, our first question is coming from Diana. Um, her question, Tina, is um, the sales that you're entering into those Excel sheets, are those gross sales? They are uh, gross inventory sales. It would not be your sale. If the question is if it's your sales tax um, and delivery, no. Your sales tax would go into sales tax payable, and your um, delivery would go into that other income I talked about. Okay. Does that answer the question, Diane? I think so. Um, Bonnie has a question. She wants to know, what is the industry standard markup on loose flowers? Um, well, on loose flowers, that's generally like a two-time markup. And in that varying markup um, spreadsheet that we went over relatively quickly, I would invite you to kind of put your sales figures in there and play around with them and try to get that loose flowers down if you want to build your walk-in traffic. Okay, yes, and those, all those Excel spreadsheets will be available at ftdi.com later today. All right, and we're just waiting to see if anybody else has any questions. We appreciate uh, all the great information you've shared with us, Tina. I know um, it's a lot of information, and this is just a little tip of the iceberg um, for uh, managing the business. While we're waiting for any questions, did you have anything else, Tina, that you wanted to share? Any, any exciting? Well, I just wanted to let everybody know this is kind of a basic place to start. It opens up, um, you know, a great conversation with your accountant. One of the things with your accountant you might want to discuss is that accountants have a tendency to lump all your sales into inventory sales, even with wire outs. And wire outs really need to be your other income because you're you're receiving 20% of that as a commission. It's not part of an inventory sale. There are no cost of goods associated with. So um, when you're doing that, you want to make sure have an open conversation with your accountant. They're used to, um, for a retailer, they sell a product, so they have a sale total and then a cost of goods total. They're unaware of the other associated costs with it, the sales portion of it, which would be those wire outs. So, and that can be extremely frustrating when you're trying to control your cost of goods. But this uh, webinar really is kind of, you know, basic information on controlling your cost of goods, and um, I'm hoping it, it gets everybody excited enough to um, to explore the, the topic a little bit more. Okay, we do have a few questions lined up and ready to go, Tina. Okay. Um, Rob wants to know, can you mention some of the better POS systems out there? Well. Um, both of our locations are on uh, on Mercury, and we like that an awful lot. Um, there are some new, um, and actually FTD has one that's coming out that uh, is hosted on a cloud. I'm a big fan of that now, um, and there's several other vendors that are hosted on clouds. I think the important thing when you're trying to find a computer system that works for you, think about what you're going to do with it. For me, um, marketing is extremely important. I need it to be seamlessly in marketing. I need it to dump to my accounting system. Um, but if you're just going to buy a point of sale system just to a key in um, order tickets and that's all you want it to do, then take a look at them. I know that um, FTD has them, Teleflora has them. Um, there are several other uh, 
I think Stargazer, what used to be Stargazer Productions has some. There's a company out of Canada that has them. Um, there's so many of them out there, to be honest with you. I can only speak to, and we've looked at all of them um, and have, have had several uh, point-of-sale systems. Um, we're extremely happy with Mercury N, one of the, not because we're, I'm talking here with you with FDD, but because of the uh, seamless integration of our uh, marketing and the delivery module. And to me, the, the only reason I bought Mercury is because of the delivery module. It's extremely effective and very cost savings. So, Great. Um, Great. Um, our next question comes from Jen. She wants to know, what category, category do you put dumpage to? Dumpage is when you look at when you look at your P&L statement, and we look at um, you know it has sales at the top, and at the sales there'll be sales in loose flowers, sales in fresh arrangements, sales in plants, sales in dish gardens. Then underneath that is your cost of goods category. That cost of goods category there'll be cost of goods, fresh loose, cost of goods arrangements. Um, cost of goods, plants, cost of goods, dish gardens, whatever. The last cost of good category is the dumpage. So generally what I was talking about dumpage is I'm going to um, take it out. If it's fresh flower dumpage, I'm going to take it out of that cost of goods fresh flower dumpage. And um, I'm sorry, I'll take it out of cost of goods fresh flowers. And I will credit that and then uh, debit the dumpage account. And the reason for that is is because I want to keep track of how much dumpage I dump per year. They're all cost of goods. They all go in that section of your P&L statement. The difference is I'm moving it from one category to the dumpage so that I can keep track of how much I dump a year. Okay. Bonnie's question is, with all the order gathers around, do you still charge an outbound wire order fee, and if so, how much? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, we do. We have a relay fee. It's $4.99. And um, essentially, that's just a, a calculated cost on what it costs to have that uh, technology to transmit the orders for us. All right. Uh, Jim's kind of tied in questions. Do you calculate wire ends at 80% for cost of goods sold, or is the 20% considered a sales discount? Um, Actually, you, you would put the total amount in because uh, it's an inventory. It is not a sales discount. Um, in your P&L statement, it comes under commission expense. So when you're looking at your P&L statement, your first set of numbers are your sales. Your second net set of numbers is your cost of goods, which gives you your net um, profit on inventory sales. Then in your expense categories is where um, your commission expense would go which would be that 20%. Okay. Uh, Amy's question, she wants to know, what are some of the benefits of donating yearly garage sales to charity versus having a sale? Well, either way, it's, a, it's an expense. The, um, the, the difference is, is how much you donate. You want to be very careful. I mean, you want to check with your accountant on this, but um, you want to be very careful about the, n the number that shows up in donations. If it's extremely high when you file your tax return, that's going to send up a red flag. And that's something I would check with my, um, my accountant on. I mean, that's not something I, I could easily quote. Um, so the benefit to me on donations opposed to, to that revenue is that um, we get a lot of PR from that. So not only um, that, that PR in some ways make, makes up for the, the loss and the discount. All right, we've got a question from Jamie. She wants to know, how do you advise handling incoming wire orders? She said, usually they don't give you enough money to, make, to even make the order, let alone make any money on it. Well, incoming wire orders, um, you know, we're talking about co controlling cost of goods. You're going to want to make sure that um, you have a great POS system, so especially on incoming wire orders that you don't overstuff them, meaning, you know, you need to pick that extra flower. Be very careful about looking at the size of the arrangement um, and the container that you use. And uh, a lot of times you can um, limit your product line so that the containers, um, like if it's I'm trying to think of the XX4037 or whatever. A lot of those come in, in very similar containers. Um, so limit your product line. That will help a little bit defer the cost of your incoming, you know, your incoming orders. But primarily, you just want to make sure that you do not overstuff. 
The great thing about incoming wire orders, especially if you're a new store or even if you're an established store, it gives you the opportunity to get into someone's home. And the way you market to them is extremely important. You know, enclose a, um, you know, if you need to buy something, a gift certificate or a, a thank you card that they can use to thank the, the sender. Um, essentially, you want to be able to get your product in the store and them to go, oh my gosh, these flowers are gorgeous. And they came from Designs of the Times. All right. Um, Diana has a question. She's wondering if you can show how the general ledger would look, for example, on a replacement order. Oh, absolutely. Um, let me go back. To, well, I can go back to that slide because let me find it real quick. Because what you can do is while you're looking for that, Tina, I just wanted to let you know that Mary had a comment. She's very excited um, to begin reducing your cost of goods sold. She wants to thank us very much. Thank you very much for the great information that you've shared. So that's very sweet. Thank you. Um, let me get back up to that slide, and I'll put it back up so we can take a look at it. There we go. Okay, we're, what we're, where we're going to want to look is right down here. And uh, obviously, you want to, um, first of all, create a house account um, and you know, name it after your flower shop, and then whether it's a donation, a promotion, or replacement. Um, every time you do a replacement, you want to bill the invoice to this account. Now, you can take it one step further, which we do. We have uh, product codes. So if it's uh, poor quality, uh, late delivery, we use that product code or an inventory code so that we can track how many um, in theoretical inventory things that we have that were poor quality or delivery or sales issues. But for general information today, we're going to talk about um, billing it to that account. We're not going to talk about the inventory item. But we're going to um, bill that invoice to that account. And then monthly, you need to pay that account. So if your um, account is Designs of the Times replacement, then um, at the end of the month, let's say I have $100 in retail value of replacements I've sent. At the end of the month, I'm going to pay that $100 um, with a theoretical, theoretical check. Okay. Once I do that, the next thing I need to do is I need to go into my general ledger and I want to say, uh, um, bleh, I want to remove that sales because um, Obviously, you didn't calculate sales tax on it because it's a tax-free purchase. But I want to remove those sales out of it so I'm not paying income tax on a sale that didn't really actually happen. It was more of a replacement. So I'm going to debit the sales account for that. And then um, I'm going to credit the cash account for that. So that's the both sides of the journal entry at 100%. So 100% of the sales. So if there's $100 in fresh flower replacement, I'm going to debit um, fresh sales or uh, fresh arrangement sales for that hundred dollars, and then when I it, when I've done the payment, so now I've got theoretically in a cash account a hundred dollars because I just paid that account, and I'm going to credit it to get rid of that cash. So that's the both sides of that accounting process. But now I need to once I've you know tracked it, I've created the ticket, I've paid the ticket. Now I need to get that expense into the general ledger, and that's where you'll be tracking it, and that's how you get it into the the replacement account. And in this case, let's say our cost of goods were 33%. So I'm going to calculate 33% um, of $100, which is going to be $33. So for this uh, example, I'm going to take $33 and I'm going to debit replacement account, $33. And I'm going to credit the cost of goods, because this really wasn't a cost of goods um, expense, it's a, a replacement expense. And so that way I'm not getting charged for the cost of goods on that. I hope that makes sense. I certainly have a worksheet I can send to headquarters um, that we that we use that automatically calculates it for you. You just put in your percentage, and I'd be happy to send that to headquarters so that you have it on file. Or you can email me at the address we talked about, and I can send it to you directly. Great, thank you. Yeah, Diana said that that's that's definitely great information. Um, and if you want to move to the final slide, Tina, have your email address back up there in case anybody needs it. 
Um, okay. But it does look like we are out of questions for today. Um, so I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, if you missed a portion of it, or thank you. If you want to listen to it again, obviously there's a lot of great information in there. Um, and that we will have a replay that will be available on FTD University online in a few weeks. Um, in the meantime, the webinar materials, including the Excel spreadsheet, will be available at ftdi.com on the right-hand side of the home page. You'll see the FTD University logo. Click on that. It'll take you right in to FTD uh, University, and then you'll be able to click on the webinars, and there's a section within there called webinar materials. Um, the uh, slide shows the, the PowerPoint slides will also be available there as well. Um, we also want to uh, encourage everybody to attend, to register and attend. The uh, next FTD webinar series is scheduled for Tuesday, March 20th. FTD education team member Jeff Corbin will be showing us how to get serious with search engine optimization. Registration is already available on FTDI.com, so when you're going to get the materials, go ahead and please register as soon as possible to get your spot. Again, thank you, Tina, for showing us how to be profitable through controlling our cost of goods sold. Um, we will be sending a survey to everyone to gather your feedback on today's webinar, and we would ask that you would please complete the survey so that we can utilize your input to help improve future webinars. Thank you.